Akkadian Empire. The Akkadian Empire was the first ancient empire of Mesopotamia, centered in the city of Akkad and its surrounding region, also called Akkad in ancient Mesopotamia in the Bible. The empire united Akkadian and Sumerian speakers under one rule. The Akkadian Empire exercised influence across Mesopotamia, the Levant, and Anatolia, sending military expeditions as far south as Dilmun and Magan, modern Bahrain and Oman, in the Arabian Peninsula. During the 3rd millennium BC, there developed a very intimate cultural symbiosis between the Sumerians and the Akkadians, which included widespread bilingualism. Akkadian gradually replaced Sumerian as a spoken language somewhere between the 3rd and the 2nd millennia BC, the exact dating being a matter of debate. The Akkadian Empire reached its political peak between the 24th and 22nd centuries BC, following the conquest by its founder Sargon of Akkad. Under Sargon and his successors, the Akkadian language was briefly imposed on neighboring conquered states such as Elam and Gudium. Akkad is sometimes regarded as the first empire in history, though the meaning of this term is not precise, and there are earlier Sumerian claimants. After the fall of the Akkadian Empire, the people of Mesopotamia eventually coalesced into two major Akkadian speaking nations, Assyria in the north, and, a few centuries later, Babylonia in the south. The Bible refers to Akkad in which states that the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was in the land of Akkad. Nimrod's historical identity is unknown, but some have compared him with the legendary Gilgamesh, founder of Uruk. Today, scholars have documented some 7,000 texts from the Akkadian period, written in both Sumerian and Akkadian. Many later texts from the successor states of Assyria and Babylonia also deal with the Akkadian Empire. Understanding of the Akkadian Empire continues to be hampered by the fact that its capital Akkad has not yet been located, despite numerous attempts. Precise dating of archaeological sites is hindered by the fact that there are no clear distinctions between artifact assemblages thought to stem from the preceding early dynastic period, and those thought to be Akkadian. Likewise, material that is thought to be Akkadian continues to be in use into the Earth III period. Many of the more recent insights on the Akkadian Empire have come from excavations in the Upper Khabur area in modern northeastern Syria which was to become a part of Assyria after the fall of Akkad. For example, excavations at Talmozan, ancient Turks, brought to light a ceiling of Tarmagat, a previously unknown daughter of Naram Sin, who was possibly married to an unidentified local Endan, ruler. The excavators at nearby Tel Lalin, ancient Shekna slash Shubaten Lil have used the results from their investigations to argue that the Akkadian Empire came to an end due to a sudden drought, the so-called 4.2 kill a year event. The impact of this climate event on Mesopotamia in general, and on the Akkadian Empire in particular, continues to be hotly debated. Excavation at the modern site of Tel Brak has suggested that the Akkadians rebuilt a city, Brak or Nagar, on this site. For use as an administrative center. The city included two large buildings, including a complex with temple, offices, courtyard, and large ovens. The Akkadian period is generally dated to either, according to the Middle Chronology timeline of the ancient Near East, or, according to the Short Chronology timeline of the ancient Near East, it was preceded by the early dynastic period of Mesopotamia, Ed, and succeeded by the Earth III period, although both transitions are blurry. For example, it is likely that the rise of Sargon of Akkad coincided with the late Ed period and that the final Akkadian kings ruled simultaneously with the Gyushan kings alongside rulers at the city-states of both Uruk and Lagash. The Akkadian period is contemporary with, EB4, in Israel, EB Ivanage 4, in Syria, and EB5, in Turkey. The relative order of Akkadian kings is clear. The absolute dates of their reigns are approximate, as with all dates prior to the late Bronze Age collapse c. 1200 BC. The Akkadian Empire takes its name from the region and the city of Akkad, both of which were localized in the general confluence area of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Although the city of Akkad has not yet been identified on the ground, it is known from various textual sources. Among these is at least one text predating the reign of Sargon. Together with the fact that the name Akkad is of non Akkadian origin, this suggests that the city of Akkad may have already been occupied in pre Sargonic times. Sargon of Akkad, Sherukin equals legitimate king, possibly a title he took on gaining power, defeated and captured Lugal's HC in the Battle of Uruk and conquered his empire. The earliest records in the Akkadian language date to the time of Sargon. Sargon was claimed to be the son of Laobam or Bel, a humble gardener, and possibly a higher duel, or priestess to Ishtar or Inanna. 
One legend related to Sargon in Assyrian times says that later claims made on behalf of Sargon were that his mother was an Intu priestess, high priestess. The claims might have been made to ensure a descendancy of nobility, considering only a highly placed family can be made such a position. Originally a cupbearer, Rob Shake, to a king of Kish with a Semitic name, Urzababa, Sargon thus became a gardener, responsible for the task of clearing out irrigation canals. The royal cupbearer at this time was in fact a prominent political position, close to the king and with various high level responsibilities, notes suggested by the title of the position itself. This gave him access to a disciplined corps of workers, who also may have served as his first soldiers. Displacing Urzababa, Sargon was crowned king, and he entered upon a career of foreign conquest. Four times he invaded Syria and Canaan, and he spent three years thoroughly subduing the countries of the West to unite them with Mesopotamia into a single empire. However, Sargon took this process further, conquering many of the surrounding regions to create an empire that reached westward as far as the Mediterranean Sea and perhaps Cyprus, Captra, northward as far as the mountains. A later Hittite text asserts he fought the Hattian king Nerdagel of Borushanda, well into Anatolia, eastward over Elam, and as far south as Magan, Oman, a region over which he reigned for purportedly 56 years, though only four year names survive. He consolidated his dominion over his territories by replacing the earlier opposing rulers with noble citizens of Akkad, his native city where loyalty would thus be ensured. Trade extended from the silver mines of Anatolia to the lapis lazuli mines in modern Afghanistan, the cedars of Lebanon and the copper of Magan. This consolidation of the city-states of Sumer and Akkad reflected the growing economic and political power of Mesopotamia. The empire's breadbasket was the rain-fed agricultural system of Assyria and a chain of fortresses was built to control the imperial wheat production. Images of Sargon were erected on the shores of the Mediterranean, in token of his victories, and cities and palaces were built at home with the spoils of the conquered lands. Elam and the northern part of Mesopotamia, Assyria slash Subertu, were also subjugated, and rebellions in Sumer were put down. Contract tablets have been found dated in the years of the campaigns against Canaan and against Sarlacc, king of Gudium. He also boasted of having subjugated the four quarters, the lands surrounding Akkad to the north, Assyria the south, Sumer, the east, Elam, and the west, Martu. Some of the earliest historiographic texts, ABC 19, 20, suggest he rebuilt the city of Babylon, Babilu, in its new location near Akkad. Sargon, throughout his long life, showed special deference to the Sumerian deities, particularly Inanna, Ishtar, his patroness, and Zababa, the warrior god of Kish. He called himself the anointed priest of Anu in the great Sea of Enlil and his daughter, Andena, was installed as priestess Donana at the temple in Ur. Troubles multiply toward the end of his reign. A later Babylonian text states it refers to his campaign in Elam, where he defeated a coalition army led by the king of Awan and forced the vanquished to become his vassals. Also shortly after, another revolt took place. Sargon had crushed opposition even at old age. These difficulties broke out again in the reign of his sons, where revolts broke out during the nine-year reign of Rimush, 2278-2270 BC, who fought hard to retain the empire, and was successful until he was assassinated by some of his own courtiers. Rimush's elder brother, Manish Tushu, 2269-2255 BC, succeeded him. The latter seems to have fought a sea battle against 32 kings who had gathered against him and took control over their pre-Arab country consisting of modern-day United Arab Emirates and Oman. Despite the success, like his brother he seems to have been assassinated in a palace conspiracy. Manish Tushu's son and successor, Naram Sin, 2254-2218 BC, due to vast military conquests, assumed the imperial title King Naram Sin, King of the Four Quarters, Mughal Naram Sin, Sarkibrit Arbem. The Four Quarters as a reference to the entire world. He was also for the first time in Sumerian culture, addressed as the god, Sumerian equals Dingir, Akkadian equals Alu, Avagat, Akkad, in opposition to the previous religious belief that kings were only representatives of the people towards the gods. He also faced revolts at the start of his reign, but quickly crushed them. Naramsan also recorded the Akkadian conquest of Ebla as well as Arminum and its king. Arminum location is debated. It is sometimes identified with a Syrian kingdom mentioned in the tablets of Ebla as Armi. The location of Armi is also debated, while historian Adelheid Otto identifies it with the citadel of Bazi, Talbana complex on the Euphrates River between Ebla and Talbrak, 
Others like Wayne Horowitz identify it with Aleppo. Further, if most scholars place Arminum in Syria, Michael C. Estauer believes it to be located north of the Hamran Mountains in northern Iraq. To better police Syria, he built the royal residence at Talbrak, a crossroads at the heart of the Kabur River basin of the Jezira. Naramsin campaigned against Magan, which also revolted. Naramsin marched against Magan and personally caught Mandanu, its king, where he instated garrisons to protect the main roads. The chief threat seemed to be coming from the northern Zagros Mountains, the Lulubis and the Gushans. A campaign against the Lulubi led to the carving of the victory stele of Naramswen, now in the Louvre. Hittite sources claim Naramsin of Akkad ibn Ventura Dinto Anatolia, battling the Hittite and Hurrian kings Pamba of Hatti, Zipani of Kanesh, and fifteen others. This newfound Akkadian wealth may have been based upon benign climatic conditions, huge agricultural surpluses, and the confiscation of the wealth of other peoples. The economy was highly planned. Grain was cleaned, and rations of grain and oil were distributed in standardized vessels made by the city's potters. Taxes were paid in produce and labor on public walls, including city walls, temples, irrigation canals, and waterways, producing huge agricultural surpluses. In later Assyrian and Babylonian texts, the name Akkad, together with Sumer, appears as part of the royal title. As in the Sumerian Lugal Kenji Ikur your Akkadian Sarmat Sumeri U Akkadi, translating to King of Sumer and Akkad. This title was assumed by the king who seized control of Nippur, the intellectual and religious center of southern Mesopotamia. During the Akkadian period, the Akkadian language became the lingua franca of the Middle East, and was officially used for administration, although the Sumerian language remained as a spoken and literary language. The spread of Akkadian stretched from Syria to Elam and even the Elamite language was temporarily written in Mesopotamian cuneiform. Akkadian texts later found their way to far-off places, from Egypt, in the Amarna period, and Anatolia, to Persia, Behistun. The empire of Akkad fell, perhaps in the 22nd century BC, within 180 years of its founding, ushering in a dark age with no prominent imperial authority until Third Dynasty of Ur. The region's political structure may have reverted to the status quo ante of local governance by city-states. Shuter Ul appears to have restored some centralized authority, however, he was unable to prevent the empire eventually collapsing outright from the invasion of barbarian peoples from the Zagros Mountains known as the Gushans. Little is known about the Gushan period, or how long it endured. Cuneiform sources suggest that the Gushans administration showed little concern for maintaining agriculture written records, or public safety, they reputedly released all farm animals to roam about Mesopotamia freely and soon brought about famine and rocketing grain prices. The Sumerian king Ernamu, 2112-2095 BC, cleared the Gushans from Mesopotamia during his reign. The Sumerian king list, describing the Akkadian Empire after the death of Shar Kali Shari, states however, there are no known year names or other archaeological evidence verifying any of these later kings of Akkad or Uruk, apart from a single artifact referencing King Dudu of Akkad. The name kings of Uruk may have been contemporaries of the last kings of Akkad, but in any event could not have been very prominent. The period between BC and 2004 BC is known as the Earth Re period. Documents again began to be written in Sumerian. Although Sumerian was becoming a purely literary or liturgical language, much as Latin later would be in medieval Europe. One explanation for the end of the Akkadian Empire is simply that the Akkadian dynasty could not maintain its political supremacy over other independently powerful city states. One theory associates regional decline at the end of the Akkadian period, and of the first intermediary period following the Old Kingdom in ancient Egypt was associated with rapidly increasing aridity and failing rainfall in the region of the ancient Near East, caused by a global centennial scale drought. Harvey Weiss has shown that archaeological and soil stratigraphic data define the origin, growth, and collapse of Sabir, the third millennium rain fed agriculture civilization of northern Mesopotamia on the Haber Plains of Syria. At 2200 BC, a marked increase in aridity and wind circulation, subsequent to a volcanic eruption, induced a considerable degradation of land use conditions. After four centuries of urban life, this abrupt climatic change evidently caused abandonment of Tel Elan, regional desertion, and collapse of the Akkadian Empire based in southern Mesopotamia. Synchronous collapse in adjacent regions suggests that the impact of the abrupt climatic change was extensive. Peter B. The Minocle, 
has shown there was an influence of the North Atlantic Oscillation on the stream flow of the Tigris and Euphrates at this time, which led to the collapse of the Akkadian Empire. Excavation at Tel Leyland suggests that this site was abandoned soon after the city's massive walls were constructed, its temple rebuilt and its grain production reorganized. The debris, dust and sand that followed show no trace of human activity. Soil samples show fine wind-blown sand, no trace of earthworm activity, reduced rainfall and indications of a drier and windier climate. Evidence shows that skeleton-thin sheep and cattle died of drought, and up to 28,000 people abandoned the site, seeking wetter areas elsewhere. Tel Brak shrank in size by 75%. Trade collapsed. Nomadic herders such as the Amorites moved herds closer to reliable water suppliers, bringing them into conflict with Akkadian populations. This climate-induced collapse seems to have affected the whole of the Middle East, and to have coincided with the collapse of the Egyptian Old Kingdom. This collapse of rain-fed agriculture in the upper country meant the loss to southern Mesopotamia of the agrarian subsidies which had kept the Akkadian Empire solvent. Water levels within the Tigris and Euphrates fell 1.5 meters beneath the level of 2600 BC, and although they stabilized for a time during the following Earth period, rivalries between pastoralists and farmers increased. Attempts were undertaken to prevent the former from herding their flocks in agricultural lands, such as the building of a wall known as the Repeller of the Amorites between the Tigris and Euphrates under the Earthry ruler Shu Sin. Such attempts led to increased political instability. Meanwhile, severe depression occurred to re establish demographic equilibrium with the less favorable climatic conditions. Richard Zettler has critiqued the drought theory observing that the chronology of the Akkadian Empire is very uncertain and that available evidence is not sufficient to show its economic dependence on the northern areas excavated by Weiss and others. He also criticizes Weiss for taking Akkadian writings literally to describe certain catastrophic events. According to Joe Notes, at Tel Brak the soil signal associated with the drought lies below the level of Naram since Palace. However, evidence may suggest a tightening of Akkadian control following the Brak event. For example the construction of the heavily fortified palace itself and the apparent introduction of greater numbers of Akkadian as opposed to local officials, perhaps a reflection of unrest in the countryside of the type that often follows some natural catastrophe. Furthermore, Brack remained occupied and functional after the fall of the Akkadians. The Akkadian government formed a classical standard with which all future Mesopotamian states compared themselves. Traditionally, the Insi was the highest functionary of the Sumerian city-states. In later traditions, one became an Insi by marrying the goddess Inanna, legitimizing the rulership through divine consent. Initially, the monarchical Lukal, Lu equals man, Gal equals great, was subordinate to the priestly Insi, and was appointed at times of troubles, but by later dynastic times, it was the Lukal who had emerged as the preeminent role, having his own E, equals house, or palace, independent from the temple establishment. By the time of Mesalim, Whichever dynasty controlled the city of Kish was recognized as Sar Kisati, equals king of Kish, and was considered preeminent in Sumer, possibly because this was where the two rivers approached, and whoever controlled Kish ultimately controlled the irrigation systems of the other cities downstream. As Sargon extended his conquest from the lower sea, Persian Gulf, to the upper sea, Mediterranean, it was felt that he ruled the totality of the lands under heaven, or from sunrise to sunset, as contemporary texts put it. Under Sargon, the NCS generally retained their positions, but were seen more as provincial governors. The title Sar Kisadi became recognized as meaning Lord of the Universe. Sargon is even recorded as having organized naval expeditions to Dilmun, Bahrain, and Magan, amongst the first organized military naval expeditions in history. Whether he also did in the case of the Mediterranean with the Kingdom of Captra, possibly Cyprus, as claimed in later documents, is more questionable. With Naram Sin, Sargon's grandson, this went further than with Sargon, with the king not only being called Lord of the Four Quarters, of the Earth, but also elevated to the ranks of the Dingir, equals gods, with his own temple establishment. Previously a ruler could, like Gilgamesh, become divine after death but the Akkadian kings, from Naram Sin onward, were considered gods on Earth in their lifetimes. Their portraits showed them of larger size than mere mortals and at some distance from their retainers. One strategy adopted by both Sargon and Naram Sin, to maintain control of the country, was to install their daughters, Andana and Emanana respectively, as high priestess to Sin, the Akkadian version of the Sumerian moon deity, Nana, at Ur, in the extreme south of Sumer, 
to install sons as provincial and sea governors in strategic locations, and to marry their daughters to rulers of peripheral parts of the empire, Urkshan Marhash. A well-documented case of the latter is that of Naram Sin's daughter Taramagata Turk. Records at the BRAC administrative complex suggest that the Akkadians appointed locals as tax collectors. The population of Akkad, like nearly all pre-modern states, was entirely dependent upon the agricultural systems of the region, which seemed to have had top principal centers, the irrigated farmlands of southern Iraq that traditionally had a yield of 30 grains returned for each grain sown and the rain-fed agriculture of northern Iraq, known as the upper country. Southern Iraq during Akkadian period seems to have been approaching its modern rainfall level of less than per year, with the result that agriculture was totally dependent upon irrigation. Before the Akkadian period the progressive salinization of the soils, produced by poorly drained irrigation, had been reducing yields off wheat in the southern part of the country, leading to the conversion to more salt-tolerant barley growing. Urban populations there had peaked already by 2,600 BC, and demographic pressures were high contributing to the rise of militarism apparent immediately before the Akkadian period, as seen in the stele of the vultures of Enatum. Warfare between city-states had led to a population decline, from which Akkad provided a temporary respite. It was this high degree of agricultural productivity in the south that enabled the growth of the highest population densities in the world at this time, giving Akkad its military advantage. The water table in this region was very high and replenished regularly by winter storms in the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates from October to March on from snow melt from March to July. Flood levels, that had been stable from about 3000 to 2600 BC, had started falling, and by the Akkadian period were a half meter to a meter lower than recorded previously. Even so, the flat country and weather uncertainties made flooding much more unpredictable than in the case of the Nile. Serious deluges seem to have been a regular occurrence, requiring constant maintenance of irrigation ditches and drainage systems. Farmers were recruited into regiments for this work from August to October, a period of food shortage, under the control of city temple authorities, thus acting as a form of unemployment relief. Gwendolyn Leake has suggested that this was Sargon's original employment for the King of Kish, giving him experience in effectively organizing large groups of men. A tablet reads, Sargon, the king to whom Enlil permitted no rival, 5,400 warriors ate bread daily before him. Harvest was in the late spring and during the dry summer months. Nomadic Amorites from the northwest would pasture their flocks of sheep and goats to graze in the stubble and be watered from the river and irrigation canals. For this privilege, they would have to pay a tax in wool, meat, milk, and cheese to the temples, who would distribute these products to the bureaucracy and priesthood. In good years, all would go well, but in bad years, Wild winter pastures would be in short supply, nomads would seek to pasture their flocks in the grain fields, and conflicts with farmers would result. It would appear that the subsidizing off southern populations by the import of wheat from the north of the empire temporarily overcame this problem, and it seems to have allowed economic recovery and a growing population within this region. As a result, Sumer and Akkad had a surplus of agricultural products but was short of almost everything else, particularly metal ores timber and building stone, all of which had to be imported. The spread of the Akkadian state as far as the Silver Mountain, possibly the Taurus Mountains, the Cedars of Lebanon, and the copper deposits of Magon, was largely motivated by the goal of securing control over these imports. One tablet reads Sargon, the king of Kish, triumphed in 34 battles, over the cities, up to the edge of the sea, and, destroyed their walls. He made the ships from Mela, the ships from Magon, and, the ships from Dilmun tie up alongside the quay of Agat. Sargon the king prostrated himself before, the god, Dagan, and, made a supplication to him. And, he, Dagan, gave him the upper land, namely Mari, Yarmadi, and, Ebla, up to the cedar forest, and, up to the silver mountain. In art, there was a great emphasis on the kings of the dynasty, alongside much that continued earlier Sumerian art. Little architecture remains done in large works and small ones such as seals, the degree of realism was considerably increased, but the seals show a grim world of cruel conflict, of danger and uncertainty, a world in which man is subjected without appeal to the incomprehensible acts of distant and fearful divinities who he must serve a you cannot love. This somber mood, remained characteristic of Mesopotamian art. During the 3rd millennium BC, 
there developed a very intimate cultural symbiosis between the Sumerians and the Akkadians, which included widespread bilingualism. The influence of Sumerian on Akkadian, and vice versa, is evident in all areas, from lexical borrowing on a massive scale, to syntactic, morphological, and phonological convergence. This has prompted scholars to refer to Sumerian and Akkadian in the third millennium as a sprabund. Akkadian gradually replaced Sumerian as a spoken language somewhere around 2000 BC, the exact dating being a matter of debate, but Sumerian continued to be used as a sacred, ceremonial, literary, and scientific language in Mesopotamia until the 1st century AD. Sumerian literature continued in rich development during the Akkadian period. And Dana, the wife, Sumerian dam equals high priestess, of Nana, the Sumerian moon god, and daughter of Sargon of the Temple of Sin at Ur, who lived minus 2250 BC, is the first poet in history whose name is known. Her known works include hymns to the goddess Inanna, the exaltation of Inanna and Ininsagura. A third work, the Temple Hymns, a collection of specific hymns, addresses the sacred temples and their occupants, the deity to whom they were consecrated. The works of this poet are significant, because although they start out using the third person, they shift to the first-person voice of the poet herself, and they mark a significant development in the use of cuneiform. As poet, princess, and priestess, she was a person who, according to William W. Hello, set standards in all three of her roles for many succeeding centuries. In The Exaltation of Inanna, later material described how the fall of Akkad was due to Narasin's attack upon the city of Nippur. When prompted by a pair of inauspicious oracles, the king sacked the Ikur temple supposedly protected by the god Enlil, head of the pantheon. As a result of this, eight chief deities of the Anunnaki pantheon were supposed to have come together and withdrawn their support from Akkad. The kings of Akkad were legendary among later Mesopotamian civilizations, with Sargon understood as the prototype of a strong and wise leader, and his grandson Naram Sin considered the wicked and impious leader, Unheil Shushar in the analysis of Hans Gustav Guterbach, who brought ruin up on High's kingdom. Tablets from the periods reads, from the earliest days, no one had made a statue of lead, but, Rimush king of Kish, had a statue of himself made of lead. It stood before Enlil, and it recited his, Rimush's, virtues to the Edu of the gods. The copper basset key statue, cast with the lost wax method, testifies to the high level of skill that craftsmen achieved during the Akkadian period. The empire was bound together by roads, along which there was a regular postal service. Clay seals that took the place of stamps bear the names of Sargon and his son. A cadastral survey seems also to have been instituted, and one of the documents relating to it states that a certain Rumalik, whose name appears to indicate his Canaanite origin, was governor of the land of the Amorites, or Meru as the semi-nomadic people of Syria and Canaan where he called an Akkadian. It is probable that the first collection of astronomical observations and terrestrial lomans was made for a library established by Sargon. The earliest year names, whereby each year of a king's reign was named after a significant event performed by that king, date from Sargon's reign. Lists of these year names henceforth became a calendrical system used in most independent Mesopotamian city states. In Assyria, however, years came to be named for the annual presiding Limu official appointed by the king, rather than for an event. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.